and welcome. Let's think bigger, grow and succeed. And I'm thrilled to have and welcome to the studio, Ben Baker from British Columbia and Canada. Welcome, Ben. Adrian, nice to see you again. It's it's been a while since you and I have shared a mic, so it's it's great being on on the show again with you. Oh well, it's great to have you here, and uh, I've been so excited about hearing your your advice on on our topic today of thinking bigger and seeing the the bigger picture because uh, you've written a book about it and you uh, uh, you work in this area in so many ways. So. Uh, the, uh, really interested to hear your views. So I'll just uh, give your intro. And Ben believes uh, that mindset, uh, sorry, that leadership is a mindset and not a job title. And with that, Ben's goal is to work with clients to create the, the next team of leaders and enable them to engage, retain, and grow their most important valuable assets their employees. Ben's the president of Your Brand Marketing and has two focuses that uh, helps him to fulfill these passions. The first one is the one we just mentioned about leadership is a mindset and then second one is uh, he has a new platform called podcast host for hire and Ben's done over 160 episodes of your living living brand live show and his goal is to help you tell your story effectively and the stories of your clients so that you can cement relationships add value and gain insights oh that sounds wonderful Ben I, I gotta I gotta shorten that bio you know we've had to say Hi, I'm Ben. We'll just, we'll just leave it at that. We'll just we'll go from there because every single person that it just gets longer and longer, and I'm sitting there going, you know what? I'm not that important. I am, you know, I just like telling stories. Uh, well, it sounds like you're doing so much. So uh, we'd like to hear a bit about it today. Sure, absolutely. Happy, happy to tell you. Where, where do you want to start? Well. Uh, Firstly, tell us a bit, you've had a, quite a journey this year because you've just launched your new book. Would you like to share a bit about that to start? Yeah, sure. You know, with all of us in COVID, it, it uh, became a real challenge. Um, beginning of March, there was a bunch of us on a Zoom call and we were all sitting there going, okay, who's going to be the first person to lose a job because of the COVID? Then it was the, who's going to be the first person to lose all the jobs that they had over COVID. I came in second. You know, so nine months worth of world stages got pulled out from underneath me in three days. And you know what? I wasn't the only one. There's hundreds, if not thousands of speakers and, and event planners and everybody that have been dramatically affected by this. But the question is what's next? There's nothing you can do about it. I was supposed to be in Australia in August. I was supposed to be in Trinidad and Tobago in, uh, in October. But, you know, obviously none of those are going to happen. They're probably not going to happen in 2021. 20, they may happen in 2022. But you look back and you sit there going, okay, the world has changed. What do you do? And a good friend of mine, Claire Chandler, and I started having conversations. And we were going, okay, where do we go? What's next? where should businesses be going? And we both come from a leadership background. And we started, you know, having these fireside chats with each other over coffee, over Zoom. And, you know, she's in New Jersey on the East Coast of, of the United States. And I'm on the West Coast of Canada. We were having these conversations. We go, there's some really interesting stuff. We should really create a short podcast series, a limited podcast to talk about, you know, where should businesses go? Where should leadership go? You know, what are the things of the challenges that people should be looking out for and how can they fix it? And a 12 week podcast came out of it. So every Friday we sat down and we did the majority of them were 20 minutes long and we did three of them that were actually an hour long that we did live and we brought audiences in and had a really good time with it. And we started reading back these things and, and looking at it and looking at the transcripts and going, there's a book out of this. And we said, well, what format do we want the book in? And we says, we want to leave it the conversation because that's really what it was. It was a conversation with Claire back and forth about what are our ideas and our ideals and how can we help people? 
So we transcribed the book. We we did it in a you know in a in a he said she said type format. Edited it a little bit for content, you know, making it a little bit shorter, a little bit more concise. You know, a couple of the the gaffes that we'd created got rid of the ums, and we decided let's turn this into a book. And last Friday it launched. It's called oh. Leading Beyond a Crisis: A Conversation About What's Next. And you can find it on Amazon anywhere in the world. We've we've launched it worldwide on Amazon. It's available on paperback. It's available on Kindle. And the book really goes into a series of conversations about what leaders should be thinking about the next step. And the best thing about it is, at the end of every chapter, what we've done is we've asked a question of our audience. And we've left eight lines for people to write their own answers. So it's really, we're, we're inviting our audience into the conversation. And that, that's really the story of the book. Fantastic. Wow. Well, it's, uh, uh, I think it's really valuable because, uh, because we're all going through it and people will really connect with the parts in the book that, uh, that, you, that you've highlighted. And I noticed, of course, that there was a part on Think Bigger, and uh, we're looking forward to hearing a bit about, about uh, that moving forward. Now, sure, absolutely. Uh, our theme for this series of Think Bigger, Grow and Succeed is moving forward after disruption, which uh, matches in with uh, with what your uh, with your book's all about. So. Uh, uh, the first question is, what does disruption bring to business? Well, the first thing I want to do is, is redefine disruption or bring disruption back to its original definition. Over the last couple of years, disruption has made this renaissance and, and everybody's using the word disruption for everything. You know, you change the color on a skew and it's, it's disruptive. You, you, you add a, a, an extra handle to a coffee mug and it's disruptive. You know, you can even have disruptive underwear by building it in a brand new thing. None of these things are disruptive. They may be innovative, they may be creative, they may, you know, change landscape, but there's very few things in life that are disruptive. COVID-19 is disruptive. It has changed the landscape of every single person everywhere on this planet. You know, Windows 3.1, when it first came out, and we went from a DOS-based, you know, operating system to a Windows-based operating system was disruptive. So was the Apple. It's things that actually change society and, and, and create a, a demarcation between what was before and what is going to be. And COVID is that is that disruption. So my view on you know, where has the disruption been is, is that we're at a period of time where we need creative, innovative and communicative leaders more than ever. We need people that are going to sit there and say, okay, this is where we were. This is where we are. This is the challenges that we're facing today. This is where we want to go. Follow me. And it's the people who can build that trust and communicate effectively and help everybody else along the way that's going to be the true leaders moving forward. And though the companies that employ those leaders are the companies that are going to thrive moving forward. And leadership at the moment is absolutely vital because, uh, because we're going into uncharted territory and or we are in uncharted territory and uh, and people need that that reassurance and support of somebody who can help guide them through that that uh, process well think about it i mean six months ago we all went home what we thought was going to be two weeks maybe a month you know, you were sent home with maybe a laptop, a few extra pens, uh, you know, that was basically it. If you were lucky to have a company's cell phone, you took your company's cell phone home. But everybody said, okay, this is going to be two weeks of, of change in our life. And we're not really going to think about it. There were no policies. There were no procedures. There was no external communication. Leaders did not know how to lead external teams. They didn't know how to communicate with people. They didn't know how to, you know, bring everybody on board and make sure that everybody knew what was going on. And everybody has learned through failure. Mm -hmm. 
we've learned through success and we've learned through failure and we've done things well and we've done things poorly and we've learned from both. You know, and, and a lot of companies have just put band-aids and duct tape on policies saying, okay, well, we'll just deal with it when we get back to the office. You know, what, and we'll be, when things go back to normal, we'll, ch we'll, we'll go back to the way things are. Things are not going back to the way they are. You know, some people are gonna want to stay home. Some people are gonna want to come back to the office. Some people are gonna want a hybrid model. And it's up to the companies and the employees that work with there to sit there and re-onboard themselves and assess where they've been and assess where they are and assess where they're going, get rid of the sacred cows and figure out how can they succeed moving forward? Because now is the time as companies, we need to sit there and say, if we're gonna take a risk, if we're gonna change, if we're gonna pivot, if we're going to look at new innovative ways of doing things, now is the time to do it because everybody's in the same position. And companies that think that they're gonna just go back to doing things the way they've always done it, are gonna lose some really good staff and they're gonna lose some really good clients. Uh, it's uh, yeah. Well, it's becoming more of a reality now that we're six months into this, uh, uh, and, and ch uh, we we've it's just changed so much. Yeah, and the cha the thing is, we can't be afraid of the change because we're always been in change. We have been in change for as long as we've been living. Our parents changed, our grandparents changed, our great grandparents changed. You know, the world, the only constant in the world is change. We are always evolving. We are always changing. We are always coming up with new innovative ways of doing things. We need to just embrace the fact that we're in another normal. We're not in a new normal, we're in another normal. This is this is the way things are for now. In six months from now, it may change again. In two years from now, it may change again. So sitting there going, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll just create some new policies and that's going to be it and we're fine. No, you're going to create some things. You're going to test them out. You're going to see how the world evolves. You're going to evaluate them. You're going to sit there going, okay, this worked, this didn't work. Now we need to change again. Now we need to recommunicate with everybody what has changed, why it's changed, and why we're moving in the next in the different direction. Because the world moves extremely fast. It always has and it always will. COVID is just a slap in the face that, that wakes people up. But we've always been changing. We've always been you know, dynamic in the way the business is. We just can't afford to be complacent where a lot of companies have been complacent for the last decade, if not longer. So our next question is, uh, how important is it to keep connected and building those connections during these times of uncertainty? Connections are, are critical. And I think that now is the time to be cementing the relationships you already have. You know, the, the problem with companies is they're always looking for what's next and what's new. You know, we'll give somebody a $500 discount if they become a new client. And we're always looking to say, how do, how do we get more clients? How do we get more clients? How do we get more clients? But the problem is they're ignoring the ones they already have. There's millions, if not billions, if not trillions of dollars that are missed every single year around the world by companies that are not asking their own clients, what else can we do for you? How else can we help you? What else can we do to be valuable to you? What, what changes are you seeing? What, you know, what, what do you need that we're not currently providing for you that we might be able to do? And we're so worried about acquiring new clients, we're losing clients on the backside. So the more we can form stronger relationships with our vendors, our strategic partners, our employees, our customers, the more we can communicate with them and sit there and say, guys, we're all in the boat together. We're all gonna row, you know, we're, the boat's either gonna sink or it's gonna, or it's gonna float based on what everybody does. You know, that's where the success comes along. And too many companies are worried about, you know, who else is out there and what am I missing instead of focusing on what they already have and cementing the relationships with the people and wowing the customers and the employees and the vendors that they already have and getting the maximum value out of the relationships that are already there. 
So Ben, we've been talking about uh, uh, what disruption brings and the importance of having connections. Uh, what are your suggest? Oh, sorry. What are your suggestions uh, that businesses do to move forward and adjust to this uh, new world? I, I think the first thing that every business needs to do is figure out where they are before they start moving forward. They need to find out what are the strengths, what are the weaknesses, where are the opportunities, and what are the threats? You know, what's their SWOT analysis? What, you know, what's the talent that they have in-house that they didn't even realize that you have? You, know, you may have somebody in your you know, office that's absolutely passionate about you know, doing infographics, and you had no idea. Well, guess what? If you can utilize their talents and be able to create different ways of communicating with your with your people through a talent that you already have in house, why wouldn't you? You know, taking a look at you know if you're a machine shop or something like that, is the tooling set up in a way that could be rejigged to be able to do something different? Is it a way that we could be more efficient by moving the machines around? You know, is there a way that you can reallocate the warehouse so that it's more effective? You know, taking a look at training your sales and marketing team, or God forbid, having your sales and marketing team actually sit down together and talk amongst themselves about the customers and how to develop true marketing that is relevant to the with in terms of messaging and is authentic to, not only to your brand but speaks to your clients needs and that can't be done in a vacuum and that silo between sales and marketing has to be broken down we got to kill that wall you know there's lots of things that companies need to do but first of all they need to sit there and say okay where are we today who do we have in house who are our customers? Who are our vendors? What other things can our vendors supply us that they're not currently doing? Talk to your customers and say, now the COVID has, we're six months into COVID or whatever it is, what do you need? What's changed? You know, what are the things that you're frustrated about? What are the things that we're not doing that you'd like us to be doing? What are the opportunities that we can help you with? And move forward and sit there and have these conversations and be creative. Because if we sit there and do an analysis of where we are, we have a far better chance of understanding where we need to go. Because that business plan that you did, you know, October, November, 2019 is gone. You might as well take that and use it for kindling. You know, it's not going to work. There. Yes, there are companies that have gone absolutely gangbusters through this and have done very well. I have friends of mine that supply hospitals that are that couldn't be busy. It's Christmas for them. You know, they're doing absolutely phenomenal. But even there, they're they're loaded to the max. They're sitting there going, "Oh my God, we can't keep up." But for the majority of businesses that have you know had slowdowns, have had challenges, had to lay off people, whatever. The question is, where are we today? Where do we want to go? And let's build a strategy there. And then we'll sit there and look at the brand, look at the marketing, look at the advertising, look at the communication, and make sure everybody within the company is on board. Everybody understands where you're going, why you're going there, and how they individually are important in moving the company forward. Mm -hmm. And that's how you're going to thrive moving forward. Yeah, I've... Uh... With my work, I work with the business development process from the from the start for getting the client for the prospects right through the different steps, and it's so interesting that there's uh, the the marketing and the sales have this uh, 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 disconnect at times, whereas they're so totally uh, totally interwound and so important for one for one to the other well the problem is they're not compensated and if they were both compensated on you know on the customer on net profit or if they were compensated the same way you would have and if their budgets were formed the same way if it was one major budget that, that allowed for sales and marketing to work together they would work together but the problem is you know Marketing does marketing in a vacuum, sales does sales in a vacuum, and they don't talk to one another, and they don't come together for meetings. 
you know, the marketing people don't go out for, uh, you know, ride alongs with the sales guys and they don't go to conferences with them. And the sales guys don't sit in on marketing meetings. And the more they can communicate with each other, the more effective they're going to be. But the problem is most companies set their some themselves up for failure because the way people are compensated, because the goals are different, because the expectations are different, because the language they use is different between the two organizations, you know, marketing and sales are both, you know, frustrated because marketing sits there and goes, we created all these leads, but, you know, sales is not following through and sales is saying the marketing, you know, the stuff that marketing is doing is totally tone deaf to what the client actually really wants and needs and desires. So, that's the problem and we need to we need to fix that because if we don't fix that companies are just destined to be commodities and they're destined to be low cost low value easily forgotten and easily replaced interesting okay so uh, moving into thinking bigger about who you are and what you offer the world uh, your comfort zone is a really important thing in this. Uh, what are the pros and cons of being in a comfort zone? Or well, not? I forget who said it, but I think somebody said, and they said it very well, that everybody should do something every single day that terrifies them a little bit. And I think that we shouldn't bet the farm every single day. We shouldn't throw craps every single day. You know, we shouldn't play the lottery every single day. But every single day we should do something that says, okay, how could I do that better? How could I do that differently? Even, you know, I tell companies, whether you win or whether you lose, evaluate. That's, it's, the military does that. And the military does that extremely well. Whether you win, whether you lose, there's a debrief and say, what could we do better? Doesn't matter if, if, they, if, if they supposedly you know, got in there, they executed perfectly, they got out, everybody lived and they achieved their goal, they're still gonna go in there and evaluate, sit there going, what could we have done better? How could we have done this even more effectively? And the same thing goes as when you fail. It's not pointing figures, it's not laying blame, it's sitting there going, what went wrong? And what could we do better next time? And I think the companies need and individuals and companies and teams and companies need to celebrate the failures and the wins and be comfortable with both. Because when they do that, they're gonna be that little bit uncomfortable and they're gonna grow. And that's, you know, that little bit of growth every day, it's that 1% or half a percent growth every single day. Over a year or three years or five years, that turns into dramatic growth either individually, as a team, as a leader, as a division, as a, you know, as a company itself, we grow because we challenge ourselves. And that's, that's what's so important. Yes, I think that's beautiful. We grow because we challenge ourselves. That, that's so true. So what are your recommendations for thinking bigger about your goals and aspirations? And you've got a whole chapter on this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do. I mean, uh, some somebody called it the other day. It called it their BHAG, their their big, hairy, audacious goal. You know, you have you have you have your short term goals, you have your long term goals, and you have this big, hairy, audacious goal. It's this: I'm going to be president of the United States. You know, I'm going to be in the thirty under thirty. I'm going to make my first million by the time I'm twenty five. And those are wonderful things to have. But if you don't have a plan of how you're going to get there, and I'm talking not just, I'm going to make a million dollars. It's like, okay, that's great. How are you going to make it? What are the steps that you're going to take? Who are the people that you need to friend you with? What are the things that you need to learn? What are the things you have to do differently? Do you have to move? Do you have to get to a different city? Do you have to change your job? Do you have to, you know, do you have to change your industry? Do you have to go back and get other education in order to do this? everybody's got to sit there and say, having those goals are wonderful, but if you don't have the strategic plan to get there, you're in trouble. And whether it's a small goal, whether it's the, the goal at the end of the day, you know, or that big, hairy, audacious goal, you need to plan for it. Uh, a friend of mine taught me this, and I've been teaching this to a lot of clients. Every day at three o'clock during COVID, what they've been doing is the team gets together and said, this is my goal for tomorrow. 
Okay, so you don't do it in the morning. You do it at the end of the day. So you sit there and say, okay, I'm challenged with this. I know I got to get this done by three o'clock tomorrow, or this is what I'm going to do. And the next day, not only do you tell people what your goal is for the following day, but you have to sit there and say, did I or did I not achieve my goal and why? And you can sit there and say, you know what? I didn't achieve my goal because this, this, and this came up. Well, that's not really an excuse, but okay, let's work on that. You know, what are you going to do? And people can hold each other's feet to the fire. Or you can say, you know what? I really needed this help and I just don't have it. Okay, who else can step in and, and make this happen? And it allows teams to understand what are the goals happening around them and be able to step up and help each other achieve their goals. So when we, when we say our goals out loud, you know, I told somebody I was going to write a book in 2020. I was going to write my second book in 2020. I write, wrote my first book, Powerful Personal Brands, in 2018. And I told people then I was going to write a book. And I told people I was going to write a book in 2020. Now I wrote a different book than I thought I was going to write. You know, the book that I was supposed to write didn't actually happen. Um, you know, it, but it got usurped by this book because it was, it was a better book and it was, you know, it was, it was more apropos, yeah. but I did, I wrote a book in 2020, but I told people I was going to write it. And when you, when you say it out loud or you write it down and you sit there and say, this is going to happen and I, and this is why, and this is how it becomes real because somebody else is able to hold you accountable. When you just say it in your mind, well, I might write a book this year. Well, that's not a goal. That's, that's, that's a wish. That's, that's a wish. And it's a difference of people realizing that goals take work and there's, there's accountability and there's work and there's sweat equity and there's people going to hold you accountable. And that's how the great things happen. If you just sit there going, well, I'd really like to make a million dollars this year. Well, that's great. How are you going to do it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, uh, what happens when one goes out of their comfort zone and tests new approaches? You know what? I think the great things happen, and, and they may not happen right away. People may fail, you know, but you only fail if you keep go if you don't keep going. The people that sit there and go, "Well, that didn't work." Okay, why didn't it work? Okay, maybe if I did this and said, okay, let's step back three steps, let's change, let's augment, let's re-strategize, let's fix it, let's go forward, you didn't really fail. You took, you know, you took another step. You know, and sometimes it's two steps back and three steps forward, and sometimes it's a step to the right, step to the left. Edison took a thousand tries before he made the light bulb. You know, he didn't fail, it just took him a thousand different iterations to make the light bulb work. And we need to think of it that way. It's just that failure is only failure when you stop and you didn't learn anything from it. Even if, even if you stop and you learned, you learned something from it that's going to let you go on and do something else, that's okay too. That's, a, that's winning on its own because you're sitting there going, this is not for me and this is why. And I tried it and I, and I, I gave it a good honest try and I didn't want to do this or I couldn't do this. And this is why, but this is what I learned from it, but it's, I've picked up this skill and this skill will allow me to do something else. You're further ahead. You may not, it may not seem that way at the, at right then and there, but you are, you're further ahead. Yeah. So experience is experience. It's, it's those, it's those holes that we, we find ourselves in. You know, and, and sooner or later, you're going to either you're going to find a way out of the hole or you're going to find a friend that's been down that hole before and is going to be able to throw you down the ladder of the rope to help you out of it. Yeah. And, and that's a good point. So a mentor or, or some uh, or a friend or a coach can really help you uh, get around that or, or through it, through the challenging times. Yeah, I mean, I... I am a coach and a mentor. I have coaches and mentors. And I don't, you know, you look at some of the most successful people in the world. I mean, Bill Gates has mentors. And none of us know everything. None of us have all seeing or all knowing. None of us have seen everything in the world. And having people we can go to and say, what do you think? Or I, I'm lost. I don't know where to go from here. 
have you got any ideas? And that's not a sign of weakness, that's a sign of strength. You know, to be able to sit there and realize that you don't know everything, even as a leader, to be able to go to people within your team and say, you know what, I've, I've got this problem that I have, what do you think? And as I said at the very beginning, leadership is a mindset, it's not a job title. And anybody and everybody has an opinion and they've got experience that you haven't got. They've done things that you haven't. And it doesn't matter if they're paid $40,000 a year or $140,000 a year. If they have the ability to fix a problem that you don't, they're valuable to you and they deserve to be listened to and, 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 you know, and, 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 and look and listen effectively. And when you say, uh, leadership is a mindset. What, what do you, what do you mean about that? A true leader is not out for themselves. It's not about the glory. It's not about the paycheck. It's not about the title bump. It's about how do you take care of people around you? A great leader wakes up every single morning and says, how can I make the people around me better? How am I going to be able to give them the tools that they need to succeed? What can I do to make them more effective? That's a great leader. And it doesn't matter if it's a first time manager. It doesn't matter if it's a, a, it's somebody who's just an employee who just started in the company three weeks ago. It's a mentality. It's a mentality of saying, how can I help other people? And, you know, great leaders within every single department, it's not about them. It's about their team. And it's about helping their people, the team to succeed. And those people realize that they're never going to be lonely and they're never going to not have a job ever again, because those are the people that get noticed. Those are the people that get promoted. Those are the people who get special assignments. Those are the people that get picked to head off to Australia or Europe or wherever to take a choice assignment for two years, because we think you're ready for it. And, you know, I've, I've always told people, take care of the people around you and you know, communicate effectively and be empathetic and your career will find itself. Uh, our next question is around what, what's the best way to approach and achieving goals? The best way to achieve goals, and I think it's going back to what I said before, is to say them out loud. You know, and, and I think for companies that means communicating what your goals are to everybody in the company. And it's not just saying we want to, you had a company this year that said, we want to be, make 20 million in 2020. You know, so they did 20 in 2020 was, was there, I don't, whether they made it or not with COVID, I have absolutely no idea. We'll see how that smokes out. But it wasn't, it's, it's not just that pithy number. It's why and how. And, and you need to be able to communicate the why and the how in, as, as well as the what. And if you can sit there and say, we want to do this because this is what our goal is. This is what we're trying to achieve. Let me tell you a story. And this is going back 24, 25 years ago. 24, 25 years ago, I worked for a company called Ingram Micro. And we were in the computer distribution business. I had one client that was a retail client that was a $100 million client of mine. And I traveled across North America, but one day I was, I was on the flight and I knew it was coming close. We were getting up to the point where we were going to do a billion dollars in sales that year. And we were going to do a billion dollars in sales. And we, we knew as an organization that that was our goal and everybody was working towards it. Everybody was achieving it. Everybody had that. We had signs up everywhere and we had, you know, we had ticker counters and, and we had, you know, every, we got a refresh on a daily basis to know how close we were getting. And I was in the air and I was coming home. And when I got off the plane, there was somebody waiting for me with a sweatshirt that said billion dollar bound because at 10 o'clock that morning, while I was in the air, they opened up boxes at every single office across Canada and had sweatshirts for every single employee because right then and there, they knew they had to get the billion bucks. Oh. And that was, you know, we got these beautiful green sweatshirts with embroidery that said billion dollar bound. And people I know 20 years later probably still have them. It was mm -hmm. just such a sense of pride. And it was such a sense of achievement because we did it together. 
And the organization really made a big deal about it along the entire way that it's the, the work of every single person within the company that enabled this to happen. It wasn't the fact that I had a $100 million account, somebody else had a $10 million account, somebody else had a $50 million account. You know, it was all everybody together. And if, you know, everybody from shipping to receiving to accounting to legal to everybody, and everybody got a sweatshirt and everybody was in on the party and we had cake and ice cream and I'm sure there was beers as well, but I missed those. But, you know, companies need to celebrate these things and they need to, they need to let people know in the company why we're trying to do this and keep letting them know what's happening. Because the more we, we let people know where are we achieving the goal, what do we need, how, how you know, we're close, we're, we've run into snag, this is what we need from people to over to overachieve it. You know? And it, when we do that as companies and we motivate people, it's amazing what we can come up with. Mm, fantastic. Now, you're a, a branding specialist. Would you like to just give us an overview of, of how branding fits into this? And, uh, and I find it really interesting. You talk about your personal brand. Mm -hmm. And yeah, would you like to give us a bit of an overview of that? Well, the definition of a brand is, and I'll, and I'll paraphrase Jeff Bezos from Amazon, it's how do people think about you when you're not in the room? It's not your logo. It's not your color scheme. It's not your advertising. Your, you know, it, it's not even anything to do with how your your office is set up. It's what do you believe in? What is the things that you believe in as a company? What are the things that are important to you as a company? What's the hill you're willing to die on? What's the things that you fight for? And what are the things you fight against? Where's your true value in the market? Who are the people that you help how do you help them and why do you help them <clears throat> sorry because when you do that when you understand what your brand is and who you serve and why you serve them then you can go to market then you can tell that story effectively and that's telling that story is your marketing and that marketing is how you build long-term clients it's how you build trust it's how you build authority it's how you get people to tell and retell your story for you and be able to internalize it and be able to sit there and believe in it. You know, your advertising is something completely different. Your advertising is we have something to sell. It's on sale today, buy it today. Your marketing is based on your brand and your brand is who you are. Nike is not a shoe company. It's not a clothing company. It's not, you know, anything that you associate the brand of, of Nike with. Nike is about excellence. It's about personal excellence. It's about striving for excellence and being, being the best person you can be. That's what, you know, that's what Nike is about. Apple is about innovation. It's an innovation company. It's about being on the inside. It's being the, you know, the people that are the, on the inside and the people with the no, the hip, the, you know, the, you know, the people that have got the inside track. That's what, that's what Apple is about. It's not Apple computer company anymore. It's Apple, you know, and Apple can go anywhere. Apple can sell insurance, but their insurance better be hip and happening. <laughs> you know, so it's a matter of understanding what is the brand of a company all about? What, you know, what's the essence of what they do? Why do they do what they do? That's the brand. Then you go out and tell that to the world through your marketing. And uh, the, there's also your personal brand within the workplace too, isn't there? Absolutely. And your, your personal brand is the same thing. It's how do people think about you when you're not in the room? Your brand is built on trust. Your, your brand, you know, pre-COVID-19, it it's, it's shaking somebody's hand, you know, looking in them in the eye and say, I will take care of it and people knowing that you will. And that's building, that's building a personal brand. When I left my partner 13 years ago and went out on my own, I sent a simple email that said, same great service, brand new name. And 90% of my customers followed me because they trusted me. 
They knew that I was going to be the one that took care of them. They, the relationship was not with me. It was not with the company I was with. It was, it was with me. I, I was the brand that they trusted. I was the brand that they had a relationship with. I was the brand that understood them and took care of them. Mm. And it, you know, and people need to figure that out because as a leader, your brand determines how the people you lead feel about you. If they think that you're a micromanager, if they think that you're, you know, you don't listen, if they don't think you're empathetic, if they don't think that you're, that they're trustworthy, you're not. It doesn't matter what you think of yourself. If people around you don't trust you, you are not trustworthy. Period. End of story. And you need to sit there and realize, why don't people think I'm trustworthy? Why don't people like me? Why don't people, you know, why aren't people following me? Why won't people do what I ask them to do? And a lot of it comes down to some soul searching and sit there going, okay, what are the things that I'm doing that are totally contradictory? Because if you say one thing and do another, people are going to be apt to under, to believe what you do rather than what you say. Yeah, that's great advice. Well, Ben, thank you so much for being with us today. It's been absolutely wonderful to hear your advice and uh, uh, hear how how you approach this uh, this new world that we're living in. Oh, it's absolutely my pleasure. And if anybody wants to get in touch with me, they can get in touch with me through uh, you know through LinkedIn at Your Brand Marketing or through the yourbrandmarketing.com website. You know, always happy to have a conversation, always happy to help people sit there and say, how do we get from where we are to where they want to be? And that's, that's my goal. And you've kindly given the listeners uh, a chapter of your book. Yeah, so, the, the chapter of the book, the book is called Leading Beyond a Crisis, A Conversation About What's Next. And uh, I don't know if you have a, you know, somewhere in your show notes that you're able to do that, or if it's, it's a bit, it's a bitly. So you go to bit.ly, L-Y, backslash, leading, capital L, E-A-D-I-N-G, and then it's free chapter, and, and free chapter is all in capitals. Mm -hmm. So it, it doesn't translate very well to the radio, but <laughs> you know, we'll, we'll, ho hopefully you guys have a way to be able to, to put in the show notes for yeah. everybody to, to get it. We'll put it in the show notes, that's Perfect. fine. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much, Ben. Take care. Cheers.